We'll do this again. Today is Tuesday, December 10th, 2013, and this is the start of an interview with Daniel Landry at the Denham Springs Walker Branch of the Livingston Parish Library in Livingston, Louisiana. Uh, my name is Sarah Colombo. I will be the interviewer. I'm the head of adult services for the Livingston Parish Library. And we'll be talking to Mr. Landry about his knowledge of Denham Springs and education in the area and yeah. whatever else he wants to share with us. So first, just go ahead and introduce yourself. Yes, I'm Daniel Landry Sr. Uh, I'm a lifetime resident of Denham Springs, Louisiana. Okay. Um, when were you born? I was born uh, November 1st, 1947. Where were you born? I was born here in Denham Springs, and I was not born uh, in the hospital. I was born at home. Oh, really? <laughs> Midwife. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, where did you go to school? Uh, I began uh, and completed my uh, uh, education uh, pre uh college education at West Livingston uh, Elementary and High School in Denham Springs. That was located formerly on what was Rodeo Drive in, here in Denham Springs. It has since been renamed Martin Luther King Drive in Denham Springs. Uh, and I attended school there from roughly 1952 until my graduation in uh, May of uh, 1965. Okay. So when you started school, the schools were still segregated in, in this yes, area? Yes, yes. Okay. I, I, uh, all of my education was in a segregated uh, a school, as West Livingston was at that time. West Livingston was a uh, elementary, uh, well we didn't have, when I went to school we didn't have kindergarten, uh, what we call primary school. We started in grade one at about, uh, age five and some 12 years later hopefully you graduated <laughs> from, from the same school and all of the, all of the the entire plan of the school was contained on that one site uh, grades one through 12. oh really yes did you have the same teacher for multiple years or a different teacher each year uh no basically we had a, a different uh teachers beginning with the first grade teacher there were uh only in uh in fact is I can't recall that uh, except when we got to high school and uh, at that time because we had multiple teachers because we had multiple uh, subjects and you went according to the subject uh, area to a different teacher um, but uh, no uh, basically we had a, a different teacher each year did you have tracks in your high school uh, in terms of you're asking that in terms of uh, like agricultural mechanic something like that no no uh -huh. we we had uh, we just had the core subjects and we had what uh, were what we call considered electives that you got a little dabble into uh, the girls went to homemaking and and that was an industrial arts class uh, for the uh, for the, the guys you know uh, that's about as close as it came to anything in terms of tracking and there was no that was not a, a pre-college uh, curriculum uh, shall we say everyone was, was held to and expected to to meet the course standards and of course around that time it was about it was expected that probably no more than uh, uh, 40 to 50 percent of the students would go on to to college those who would not college ready or college eligible or whatever is, is the might be the best term for it mm -hmm. they went on to other jobs or careers or, or, or did something else yeah. what were you interested in when you were in high school as far the, as hobbies the, or well sports was was always one of my assets i was uh, both an avid uh uh, sports uh, enthusiast as well as a pretty good athlete uh, during uh, my early uh, days. So, uh, however, at the school we only had one sport, and it was basketball. Oh, really? We were a small school, so we didn't have a football team, we didn't have a baseball team, but uh, through other pursuits, uh, uh, recreational 
during the summer. Uh, they would set up programs that I was. So athletics was always one of, of my pursuits. Uh, my earliest pursuit was I was in, intrigued with, be, with uh, uh, the legal field and becoming a, a, a lawyer. Uh, but the person, we didn't have any lawyers, any African American lawyers in the community, but uh, as television became more viable thing, we had an opportunity to see some of the types of careers. That was one of the things uh, that intrigued me. Uh, and. Uh, but the person who were most uh, held up uh, as our role models and as models that we could readily see in our community were school teachers. Uh, they commanded a great deal of, of respect and we thought that they made a great deal of money even though we know now that they, <laughs> they, didn't, <laughs> yeah. they really didn't. Uh, so, uh, you know, it was expected that if you went to college you were going to come out in an area generally in the teaching field, because that was, yeah. And of course the other more visible uh, areas in our community were in uh, a mortuary science, which I didn't, didn't, didn't hanker for, because I <laughs> didn't want to, we were dead folks. And of course, uh, preachers were also held in very high esteem. And uh, I didn't get the calling for that either, so. <laughs> So it, it sort of, oh, and in the, in, in the fourth wheel, that was the military, mm -hmm. yeah. So you said the, um, there was only a 40% graduation rate? No, 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 no. You said of those who, of those persons who graduated, probably 40%, probably less than that went on, went on to, uh, to, to uh, college, even though uh, preparation were being made for those of us uh, who had and showed the aptitude. Mm -hmm. uh, even before uh, No Child Left Behind and all these programs that we have come to know uh, uh, were in place, at West Livingston, which was the, the, the uh, main uh, school for a large part of the parish, especially the western part of the parish, the parish sort of divided into, there were, uh, like two, two schools. West Livingston uh, took in students all the way from Port Vinton, uh, from Walker, uh, to Livingston, all that area uh, came west to the school. And then when uh, the uh, school was built, uh, Albany Springfield, East Livingston it was called, then it took in the area of Albany, uh, uh, Springfield, and then I think, uh, Port Vincent area then went to that school. But for a long time, West Livingston was the, the only uh, black school in the, in the parish. And so that uh, persons came all the way from, uh, from the, the farthest reaches to the east, uh, no, at least as far as Livingston, Louisiana, and Port Vincent, and uh, Head of Ireland in that area, they came all the way to, to uh, the school every morning. Wow. Yeah. Did a bus take them? Yes, yes, there were buses that had a regular route to go and, and pick them up and as far uh, north as Watson, Louisiana, all the way to the St. Helena line came back and I think that some of the persons who were near to the St. Helena line just crossed over into St. Helena to go to school over there because it was, it was easier to, to, to do. Mm -hmm. mm. Um. So why do you, why do you, you obviously you went to college, right? Yes. Where did yeah. you go? <laughs> Southern University. Okay. Yeah, began attending Southern University September of, uh, of 1965. Okay. Mm. And why do you think you ended up going to college when such a small percentage of the people you went to high school with did go to college? Now by the time I graduated, now by the time I graduated, that was a higher percentage of persons who were going. Uh, but what, as I started to say, one of the, the things, even before we had uh, standards that were set up, uh, much like the testing standards that hold students accountable and accountability, uh, if you didn't make the grade, you didn't get promoted to the next grade. So that, uh, and you stayed in, that, in a particular grade until you met the standard at West Livingston, uh, which is why 
uh, even though you might have had students who were, in some cases, one or two years older than, than uh, you were in class with you because they had not met the standard. Uh, and they weren't doing social promotions uh, unless you got really, really old in a grade. And uh, then, you know, so you would find that there were quite a number of students who finally just uh, they got too old for, you know, like they'd be 14 or 15 in the eighth grade or something of that sort, uh, or, uh, and uh, they would be, they would just drop out. So a lot of those didn't, didn't make it all the way through. So did you feel like, were your parents really encouraging for you to go to college, or? Oh yeah, well our parents were uh, encouraging you were going to two places in my household that you were definitely going to be going. That was the church and the school. And uh, it was expected uh, in our family that uh, we would go on to uh, do that, despite the hardship that it sometimes caused for the family uh, financial situation and funds. Uh, but uh, my parents, uh, uh, I have uh, four siblings, and uh, we all went to to uh, college. Three of us completed college. My uh, older brother uh, spent some three years, uh, and then he eventually went. He went to the military and into uh, industrial employment. Uh, uh, he was the only one that did not finish. Uh, and at that time, we had raised our levels of expectation of what we could be. By the time I graduated from school, then I saw lawyering as a, as a distinct possibility. Uh, my older brother wanted to be an engineer, but of course that involved uh, monies and, and things that sort for the uh, supplies and uh, the stuff that you have to have in it if you, you know, and uh, waiting for one of your friends to finish at one or two o'clock in the morning so you could get started to borrow that borrow didn't sort of so I, I think that had some impact on uh, if you didn't have a grant or scholarship uh, or something of that sort it made it extremely difficult I didn't have the easiest of time uh, uh, getting through uh, college financial from a financial standpoint uh, but uh, with God's help and whatever our parents could in and of course working uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, I very fortunately, uh, I married uh, very young. I was 18 and a half when I got married. I, got, I married in 66 after having graduated in 65. And uh, my wife was very instrumental in, in uh, she worked as a food service manager at the same school that uh, we had graduated. We both graduated from West Livingston. And uh, so we were able to provide for uh, families and do all the other types of things through working and uh, going to school. So you were married after your first year of college? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And what year did you graduate? Graduated in 1965. Oh, I'm from college. from college. My first graduation uh, with my uh, bachelor's degree uh, was in 1970. What was your degree in? In uh, social studies, yeah, in the education. And I had a major in social studies, uh, concentration in political science. And then after that you went on to get a master's degree or you I worked? took a master's degree in 74 and, and uh, plus 30 in uh, 77. 30 degrees above a master's and, and oh. yeah. <laughs> I haven't heard of that. Yeah, okay. So what's your master's degree in? A master's degree was in administration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then after that, what did you start Well, the, the other hours, uh, a compilation of a myriad of, of courses, but they would uh, be in administration primarily and uh, in uh, the field, the further advanced fields of the uh, early studies of the political science and uh, social studies courses. So what did you do? Um, you said you worked while you were in college. Where did you work when you were in college? Well, uh, believe it or not, uh, 
the, the year that I started working, September, I mean, that I started college, was the year that we had one of the more uh, uh, disastrous hurricanes here, called Hurricane Betsy. And she struck September 5th, I think, in 1965. And uh, so we began, one of our first jobs was to come back off of the college, because the college campuses uh, were sort of shut down for, for a while. And uh, well, just just for about a week, so they got debris and stuff. So my, one of the first I started working with the with the city uh, of Denver Springs, removing debris and things of that sort. And uh, later, I worked uh, for the uh, who would become the future mayor, but one of the uh, mayor Herbert Hoover, uh, and uh, he owned a uh, appliance store. Uh, his appliance store was right there on the corner of Julia and Range uh, right now where you, they have the uh, uh, party store, a little party, I don't know mm -hmm. if you know, yeah. that, well, that was appliance store there. So I worked uh, part time for him while I went to, to school and uh, later I worked, uh, took a semester out of school, worked uh, at a plant in uh, St. Charles Parish with my brother, worked for the city of Denham Springs. Uh, for the street department for a short while before going back uh, to uh, complete my degree. And what did you do when you finished your degree? Uh, when well, I finished my degree, I uh, didn't have a job immediately, and I, I, I finished in uh, August of 70. Uh, I think took my uh, uh, undergrad degree uh, in August of 70 and went to work as a uh, uh, shipping uh, clerk, I guess you'd call that. My job was to make sure that packaging and stuff got to, to the post office on time and back for what was then called Maison Blanc, or Gotchals. Uh, it was an old, was a long time business in uh, uh, Baton Rouge, around 1500 Main Street, I think it was. And so I worked there and, and uh, made applications uh, for various uh, uh, jobs, East Baton Rouge Parish in particular, and uh, got, got the call in uh, uh, October. This is after the school year begun because the school year would begin in September. Uh, and I got a call and asked to come in for an interview. And uh, very thankfully was uh, awarded a position at Sherwood uh, Junior High School uh, October 5th of 70 is when I began my my teaching career. And what subject did you teach? I taught uh, social studies and English. And you said that was an elementary school? No, no, high junior school. high school. Oh, junior high, mm -hmm. okay. And how long did you work there? 11 years at uh, Sherwood. Uh, before uh, I was uh, awarded a position, uh, or interviewed for an awarded position as a personnel relations uh, special, specialist with, uh, at the school board. Uh, that job consisted of serving as sort of a spokesperson and an honest buzzman, uh, sort of between persons of staff, uh, uh, teachers, uh, food service workers, uh, mechanics, uh, whoever, if they had a difficulty, uh, they could call uh, one of us to come and to serve, at, to intercede on their behalf with, if they, uh, with whoever the difficulty was. It could, might be their immediate supervisor, the principal of a school, uh, head of the mechanics pool, or the head of food service, or whatever. This was brought about because there was a strike that was had in the East Baton Rouge Parish School System in 1979. And so to abate that and to prevent that from happening again, that was set up a me mechanism by which persons, if they were having difficulties, could come to someone and they'd try to get it resolved at a level closest to where it was happening. And that position uh, consisted of uh, persons from elementary level working with uh, elementary uh, persons, middle school level, working with persons in the middle school level, uh, high school person working with the high school level, 
and then all of us trained and, and working with persons who were uh, auxiliary personnel, for example, like in the, working with other parts of the school system. So I did, and that the limit of time it was written into the procedure that that job, that person, they would rotate that person in that job so as not to stagnate uh, that position or a person be every two two years a person would serve that position for no more than two years and then rotate it out and they'd have someone else to come in. <laughs> yeah. So what did you do after the two years? After the two years I went to Glasgow Middle School as assistant principal and I was an assistant principal there for three years and at the end of three years I was moved to the principalship at that school and in all total I was at Glasgow for a total of 14 years. And then? And then I moved to back to central office uh, to uh, serve at, with the Title I program as a Title I supervisor. And, uh, and this I, is all in East Baton Rouge Parish? All this is in East Baton Rouge Parish. In the 17 years that I spent, I spent 17 years which is culminated with my retirement uh, there on uh, October 5th of 2013, uh, exactly 43 years after I began on October 5th of 70. Wow. So <laughs> yeah. you, um, you said you were born in Denham Springs. Yes. Where, where in Denham Springs did you grow up? In the same house the whole time? Or? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, I lived in uh, what is now called Demon Street. It was not uh, Demon Street at that time. Uh, it was a. Uh, it's located just off of uh, Summer Street uh, and uh, and uh, 190. Uh, just uh, south of, of that is a road uh, is Demon Street, and uh, I grew up in that area. Uh, all the the area that comprises where the uh, West Livingston uh, School was. It's now called uh, Ellum Locker uh, Park, or West Livingston Recreation Center, and Park Ellum Locker, uh, Mrs. Ellum Locker. Uh, and we and the reason that, that the Mrs. If you look at the sign, you'll see in parentheses Mrs. And you say, well, why would they put that there? Uh, they was put there both because uh, of the impact that something happened at one of the graduations, and it didn't just happen one time, but I, I know more memorably it was there that it happened, where the, uh, uh, one of the uh, board members, uh, and I think maybe even the superintendent, uh, addressed our principal, Mrs. Louisa Mac Lockhart, who is a legend in our area, uh, when he was introduced by her and he got me said, thank you, Louise. We thought it was such a distasteful uh, disrespect for her instead of thank you, Mrs. Lockhart. Mm -hmm. And so that when the park, when the site was uh, renamed and made a, a uh, park, uh, we were very insistent that uh, that show up on the, on the Mrs. Louise Lockhart. So Mrs. Lockhart was the principal when you were there? Yes, yeah. And um, <laughs> you, you felt, or people felt she wasn't as respected maybe? Well, we or know that we, we, we know that she wasn't respected at the level that she should have been respected by the all-white school board. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, they would come to graduations, uh, and I attended graduation from the time I was uh, maybe even have been before I was in school, but I know certainly I can uh, remember that uh, one of the more memorable graduations I remember is that that graduation of uh, Arthur Perkins uh, when he graduated from high school. It was held on an open field area in the, in the, in the evening. And we sat out on the grass and stuff as they had the graduation. Uh, on a uh, little uh, platform at, at the back of one of the one of the buildings, the home economics building, I guess I want to I want to say, but uh, I can remember that, and uh, my parents 
taking us out to the to the graduation. What so, year was that one? Do you know? Uh, I think Mr. Mr. Perkins uh, probably graduated in uh, in uh, '55. Uh, so, if I was born in '47, I was probably eight years old. Yeah, you're yeah. Young. yeah. So, do you have any specific memories of Mrs. Lockhart? Maybe oh, do I have any? <laughs> yes, yeah, do I have any specific memories? Uh, I don't think uh, any history of of uh, Denham Springs in general, uh, and certainly no history of Denham Springs. Uh, in terms of the black community and her impact on the black community would be complete without a mention. And, and if you interview a hundred persons, that would be a hundred persons, I mean a hundred persons my age, uh, maybe some of the younger persons wouldn't know. But uh, Mrs. Louisa Mack Lockhart was the uh, center of everything that we, that we did. In the uh, in the black community, both school wide and community wide, uh, it was Mrs. Locker uh, who symbolized uh, for us uh, what we should be and what we could be, and uh, she was a lady who was very uh, stern but very committed to uh, all of our education. Uh, when I arrived on the scene at uh, in first grade, I already knew about Ms. Lockhart because I had siblings. I'm, I'm the youngest member of the, my four uh, siblings. And so we knew about Ms. Lockhart. And we knew uh, that if you didn't act right on the campus, she took care of that. She kept something in, in her uh, purse that would take care of that, that matter. And you asked if I have any memory, remembrance of so, Yeah, I have plenty of remembrances. <laughs> Uh, because I didn't always do what I <laughs> what I should do, uh, but this was a different time, and it was understood that she was. Uh, there's a Latin phrase for it in local parentis, it means that in in the absence of the parent, uh, she was the parent on that campus, and even on the weekend, if she heard that she had done something in the community. You 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 uh, you were brought to the office to hold accountability for it, even if you did it over the weekend, you know. And uh, she would advise you and be sure and go and tell your parent because I taught them. And so that wasn't the parent who was going to go to uh, say to Miss Locker, "Well, that happened on the weekend." And uh, I can recall <laughs> one instance where the parent gave their children some permission to go to what was, uh, we had what's called uh, Frankenton Frat. Uh, Frankenton is located up near Bugaloosa and they, have, they, have, they still have that big fair there every year. And uh, Ms. Lockhart, because she had some concerns about that, had, had put out an edict that, uh, now this didn't happen because I was still a big young, that person would not to go to that particular fair. And some persons defied her and went anyway. And uh, when they arrived at school on Monday, she knew exactly who had gone. And they all had to, had a visit with Ms. Lockhart. Yeah, yeah. So. so <laughs> you said she had. What did she have in her purse? A switch? No, she had a. a, a no, it wasn't a, wasn't a paddle. Uh, she had. Uh, Something <laughs> a leather, uh, leather strap belt. Uh, I guess I guess the strap. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. And uh, if you acted up, where you acted up at is where you were were corrected at. If you acted up at a, an assembly, and you were brought up to the front of the assembly, and that's where it was dealt with. And so, yeah, I mean it wouldn't be done today because, you know, now with lawyers uh, and persons waiting for an opportunity to pounce on every nuance or whatever, you know, but anyway, that, that's the situation that we were brought up and we were better for it, let's just put it that way, yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about that because you are, you did work in education for so many years. Mm -hmm. 
um, how how did you see it change over your lifetime between how the schools were in Denham Springs when you were growing up and then how they changed? Oh, that's, that's a vast difference. First of all, the, the, the segregation. Uh, when we were coming to school, going through school, uh, we received school books that already had been overutilized and uh, as they were discarded at one site, new schools were brought to white schools, I would suppose they brought us the, the books uh, in many cases. Now, as, as, as things increased, as I said, uh, I had 12 years to observe uh, toward the ends of some of, of that, that time, we did begin to get some of the newer resources, new book, but in, in the, it wasn't until I reached perhaps high school that I began to get books that didn't already have uh, names or uh, stamps in it that said uh, that were from uh, all white schools. You know, so that was one of the things, the, the uh, provision of resources. The West Livingston uh, campus itself, that school, uh, and there are persons who can give you history as it, it moved some three times. It was first begun in a church and then moved from a church to the area that's now on the corner there, what would be 190, I guess, uh, where the uh, uh, McDonald's is now, and later moved to the site, which later became West Livingston uh, Elementary School. Uh, uh, there are persons who can tell you that they had, every family had to provide kindling and wood for pot-bellied stoves during the early years. Probably Mr. Perkins can relate to that and may have been a part of, of, of that kind. I wasn't a part of that because by the time I got there in 52 or thereabout, uh, some things had begun to improve. Even though we were receiving the, the outdated books, I won't say outdated, but anyway, they had been for you, they want the, the new edition. So I've seen uh, transitions of that. I have seen uh, more specialized tracks put in, uh, special education uh, 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 venues and programs and improvements in terms of uh, imposition of federal funding like uh, Title I funds to help make up the difference where families uh, uh, didn't have uh, incomes and stuff, uh, Title I stepped in to, to fill those gaps because it's based on the poverty index and things of that sort. Uh, that was in East Baton Rouge though? No, no, no. Did no, them too? No, yeah. no, no. Title I is a, is a national program. And so Livingston Parish also received Title I oh, they do. Uh, funds uh, that, they, that are for the utilization of uh, filling in the gap. Uh, for educational resources to provide uh, media and cameras and and uh, books and and the things that uh, training and all all that's a part of what Title I funds are used for. So uh, all school districts receive federal funding, the Title I funding, just like they receive special education funding, uh, and uh, it's expected to be utilized to, like I said, to. Uh, filling the gaps. Uh, and yes, I, I've seen uh, uh, the, with the uh, integration of schools, uh, and I've seen it in, in both positive and negative ways. I've seen it in the positive ways in where I worked at, wherein I was given an opportunity. Because when I began working in 1970 at Sherwood, Sherwood was an, had an all-white student clientele. Uh, and then we were part of, howbeit I came about a month behind other teachers who began in September of that year, what was called crossover teachers. They were teachers uh, following the uh, court ordered uh, desegregation of schools. Uh, uh, persons, and the personnel was, was uh, integrated first. Was that the first year, 1970? Uh, 1970 was the crossover year in East Baton Rouge Parish. Uh, the uh, last year for West Livingston as a school, I think it was 
68 or 69. And they had begun with uh, integrating uh, some students, I think as early as 1968 at the high school level in uh, West Lewiston finally uh, closed as a as an elementary uh, school, grades uh, one through five, with Mr. Perkins being the principal. I think that was in '68 or '69. That, 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 that might have been the last year for it as a high school, and it may have continued one additional year as an elementary school before all the schools were fully uh, were integrated and West Lipton was closed as a facility. So, what was your experience like in the in the crossover? I, I had I had two uh, sets of experiences. One, I lived here in Livingston Parish, so I had an experience there uh, here in, in Livingston Parish, and I also had an experience uh, with the uh, system of being a teacher in a different system. Uh, the way that I ended up in uh, in East Baton Rouge Parish, let us say, is because of the fact that. Uh, as a young man, even before I graduated out of college, uh, I represented, uh, I want to say, the communities because we were, we had persons coming from all at, uh, before the school board to request that they leave West Livingston uh, open and that whites be transferred to West Livingston as opposed to transferring all black students into the other side because that was met with uh, disdain and and uh, but uh, that was part of the reason uh, because of my request to to uh, to meet uh, before the board that it was recommended it would not be a good idea for me to to, to seek a job if and when I did uh, uh, finish college. <laughs> in Livingston Parish, uh, and uh, let's just say that uh, this was done. I was a representative by that time, having had several years of college under belt, and and as I told you at one time, being a lawyer and, and being a spokesperson was nothing foreign to me. Uh, I knew that even at even at a at a young age. Uh, but there were persons who were within the school system who were fearful that their jobs might be compromised if they took any stands. And so when the call was put forth uh, that someone who would be willing to go and advocate on behalf, I felt strongly enough about the good things that had occurred for me and for many others at West Livingston, such that uh, I felt, and especially given the fact that the high school had already been uh, integrated. We were talking about leaving it open as an elementary school. And we were talking about a school at that time that had just undergone probably half a million to two million uh, to a million dollars worth of construction. New, uh, uh, new special education building, new uh, cafeteria improvements to the school uh, had been made to the building and they were willing to shut that down and just let it uh, go into ruin rather than to bring students to the school. I thought that that was both wasteful as well as, uh, yeah. So uh, I did make the, make the trek and did speak before the board. And even though it was met with, uh, uh, met with some moderate success by several persons uh, who thought that it was worth an idea worth considering. Uh, uh, for the most of the board voted uh, down the idea of keeping it open. Uh, I think they had, uh, at that time, I'm not sure whether they had nine members or seven members at that time. No, they later went to a nine member board uh, to comply with some guidelines. I think at that time probably had maybe five members on the board. And I think the vote was sort of like maybe four to one uh, in terms of closing it in favor of closing and uh, never forget that the, the one dissenting uh, uh, vote was uh, Ms. Candy Strickland uh, who uh, thought that it was an idea worth considering but uh, 
she was the only female member on that on that board. And all the males uh, voted unequivocally for closure. Yeah. Yeah. So that made it so that you felt like that, or you were told that that made it so that it was difficult for you to work in. No, I was actually no, 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 no. I was actually. Uh, <laughs> At a, at a risk of, and let's just say uh, for healing purposes, I don't dwell on it a great deal, but no, I was told specifically uh, by individuals that uh, I need not apply as long as they were, uh, had anything to do with the board. So you ended up in East Baton Rouge Parish? Yes. And, um, and you said you were, across, you were in the crossover year? The crossover was simply meant that uh, teachers from all black uh, and from all white situations uh, were sent to uh, racially different schools. Now in East Baton Rouge Parish, that involved teachers, some teachers from white situations going over to all black schools and some teachers from all black schools coming over to schools that were formerly all white. That wasn't the case here in Livingston Parish because in Livingston Parish the, all the black schools were closed and so all of the black personnel transitioned over to white, uh, uh, formerly all white schools. So they crossed the teachers over before they integrated the student body uh, in, in East Baton Rouge? In East Baton Rouge it occurred on, on uh, I think in similar, uh, both students and teachers were, were being uh, of course, not at Sherwood. At Sherwood, you had crossover the faculty first, and it was several years uh, before uh, there were any black students. Cause, because all the schools were localized schools. They had their own school district. And Sherwood Forest at that time, probably they were because of, uh, of uh, uh, living patterns determined where a person went to school, and there probably were no black families living in. Mm -hmm in the Sherwood area. But as uh, black families uh, moved into those areas, uh, I recall you had the first year, I think there were two black students among some seven, eight hundred students. You know, I think they may have lived in some uh, uh, duplexes or comp uh, apartment complexes or something. And that that put them in the in the uh, busing zone or in the zone for for that particular school, but you know now there's uh, much more uh, persons to move, and there's much more uh, you know portability persons moving into areas, moving out of areas. So that's that's not. But 40 years ago, that was that was the pattern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How was it that first year for you? My first year uh, went fine for me, you know, because I was, uh, I had uh, very good training, both uh, coming in through West Livingston and having an idea of what uh, the teaching uh, level was. Uh, Southern, Uni Southern University, where I did my undergraduate studies, prepared us very well because they could see that where the trend was, was going. And uh, uh, so, you know, I had a good year, yeah, yeah. A good first year teaching, I haven't heard that very much. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so your parents, were your parents born in this parish too? Both of my parents, I might say, uh, my mother uh, was, lived in this, parish in this area, uh, her mother uh, and uh, family lived in the area, but they were, they moved, and I wouldn't know exactly which year it was, but they moved quite early, I guess, uh, in the late 19, uh, late 1800s uh, into the Denham Springs area, and uh, they moved from an area uh, which was called uh, Deerfoot. Now, my, my parents, uh, my mother, uh, they were sharecroppers and they lived on persons, places, and they, they did uh, sharecropping and they would have a little house or something. And, and so they, 
they didn't always stay at the same uh, place, but eventually they landed uh, in this area. My grandmother, uh, Rachel Hamilton, uh, was uh, bought uh, property uh, in the area. In fact, as I live on a piece of the property now off of East Street, and uh, she bought a, a plot of land uh, which was uh, enough to provide she had nine children, uh, nine lots, uh, and I live on one of those lots uh, now. Uh, and it ran a, a, from uh, from between what is now Martin Luther King was Rodeo at one time, uh, all the way to what is Bay Street, and that's uh, each of those lots about uh, 80, 80 feet deep, about 120 feet. So if that nine nine time. Uh, uh, whatever nine times 120 years, I guess is about a thousand. Uh, she bought enough properties in one area. Uh, you have to remember that property was probably selling at about. Uh, you could probably get a, a lot of twenty-five dollars uh, uh, per lot, so you know. But that was a lot of money during that time, and uh, so that was my mother, my father. Uh, was from the uh, Sorrento area and uh, he migrated according to work patterns and where you could find work. Remember that 1947 was right after the big after the depression ended in 1945 and so persons moved and had to move according to where they could find work and uh, fortunately he moved into the area and met my mother and they were married and so as they as we might say, the rest is, is history. What was your mother's name? Wilma. Wilma Jackson. It's a maiden name, and Wilma Jackson and Landry. Uh, my father's name was Henry Landry. And uh, I bear a portion of that name. My name is Daniel H. Or Daniel Henry Landry. Are your parents still alive? No, my, my uh, father died in 1980, August of 1980. Uh, my mother died uh, in 2001. She died on uh, June 8, 2001. Where are they buried? They're buried at the Plainview Cemetery, which is off of what we call Magnolia Bridge Road. Yeah, that's the road that's uh, opposite Lockhart Road here in Denham Springs, but going uh, west into Baton Rouge. Uh, if you were to uh, uh, travel down 16, and when you arrive at that light, which is Lockhart Road, Magnolia Bridge Road, make a left, going into East Baton Rouge Parish, and uh, go, uh, I guess, about 300 yards. Uh, and there's a, a little road that detours off to what is called Plainview Cemetery, and they are both buried there. What year was your mother born? Uh, my mother was born in 1912. My father was born in 1902. 1902? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you have how many siblings? Uh, there, uh, I have uh, three other siblings, yeah. Uh, my older brother, Charles, uh, uh, he's about nine and a half years older than I am. What's uh, his birthday? Uh, he's, he's born uh, uh, August the uh, 13th of... Uh, uh, I want to say uh, 36, I guess, uh, whatever nine years would be. I don't. I have to go back and compute it. Then my older sister Elizabeth uh, is. Uh, she's 71. Uh, she still uh, lives, uh, and uh, she lives in East Baton Rouge Parish, but maintains uh, properties here. And then my sibling that's next to me, Sarah, whom you've met. Uh, she's still a teacher up at uh, Denham Springs Elementary School. I think she's going to her 46th year. And uh, she's uh, two years older than me. What's her married name? Uh, Sarah Scott. And your other sister, is she married? Uh, Elizabeth Smith. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any children? Yes, I have five children. Uh, <laughs> and uh, some 25 grandchildren. And so my oldest daughter is Dana. Uh, Dana was uh, 
born uh, November uh, 20th in uh, 66. And then my son Daniel was born 14 days after I started, some 14 days after I started teaching. He was born on uh, 19th of October, 1970. And my middle daughter, uh, Denisha, uh, uh, Danita, I'm sorry, Danita, born May 2nd. And she was born in 74. Uh, my youngest daughter, Denisha Goldman, uh, Landry Goldman, uh, and she was born uh, June 6th of uh, 76. And then my youngest son, uh, Danica Landry, uh, he was born on uh, June 21st of uh, 79. And what's your wife's name? My wife is deceased, uh, a late wife. Carolyn Morris was a middle, a maiden name, uh, Landry. She's also interned at, uh, at uh, Plainview Cemetery. And what year did she pass away? She passed in uh, June 21st of uh, 2001. And um, what she, did she do? She was food service uh, manager here in the parish. She was food service manager at Southside Elementary School on the range in, in Denver Springs. And she, at the time of her passing, she was the uh, only black food service manager in this parish. Mm. Um, how far back do you know of your family history? In terms of how much I actually know, how much uh, I've done research, uh, or, Either you know, one, you know, I, the farthest back ancestor you know or what you know about them? Probably the farthest ancestor I know back is my grandmother. Uh, both of my grandmothers didn't know either of my grandfathers, but both of my grandmothers on my father's side and my mother's side. Uh, my grandmother, uh, uh, my father's mother's name was Delphine Sylvester. Uh, and uh, then my uh, mother's mother was Rachel Hamilton uh, uh, Jackson. And uh, the other information we gotten had been handed down or passed down by our parents. Uh, but I knew both of my grandmothers. Uh, and uh, that's, as, that's, that's, I guess, as far as my history goes back in terms of actual knowledge of them or, my, or those grandparents. The only ones you met? Yeah. What stories have you heard about your family before then? Anything? Just that they were sharecroppers and that they had to move. My, my father uh, and their family, they moved. Uh, they had to move and they came to the uh, to uh, the Denham Springs area. Uh, that My father lived in the area around the Gonzales Sorrento area. and. He would tell us some of the things about the boyhood and things were coming up, times were hard they went through. Uh, not only one, but evidently he lived through two depressions. Uh, and they would tell us about how hard to think, times were and things of that sort. Uh, you know, but uh, most, of my, most of my actual vivid memories of, of my grandparents were that they were church loving, fun loving, uh, persons and uh, uh, very strict and orthodox in terms of what they expected from the children and grandchildren and, and uh, grandchildren uh, didn't receive any special dispensation if they bis disbehave, misbehave uh, we could be disciplined by any of our relatives uh, uh, I had aunts and uncles and uh, the extended family was very very important uh, if you acted up or misbehaved at church or out in the street or did whatever, you not only got that spanking or whatever uh, from, uh, I can remember being uh, four or five years of age and, and uh, having, my mother uh, did uh, uh, housework and uh, she went to various not only one family, but she had a certain number of days in this family, and then they had another uh, certain number of days with 
some of the other families, some of the more prominent families uh, in the Denham Springs area because she was very good at what she she did. And so by word of mouth, they would uh, they would pass it on at the country clubs, I guess, or whatever, that uh, such and such a person was uh, excellent in terms of housekeeping and ironing and things of that sort. So that was no shortage of, and so, uh, you know, actually the person during that time, to <laughs> be honest with you, would make contracts between themselves, I mean families. Well, you know, I have on such and such a day, that can I have on such and such a day? Now, of course, that's with the with the person consenting, but they would they would get they would actually get sort of like approvals between families. Uh, you know, is it all right if I contact her uh, about coming to me on the on the day that yeah you know I'll, I'll tell you to expect it, you know that that kind of stuff. I I hadn't seen the movie to help, but I imagine it was something very uh, very similar uh, to like that, but. Lest I digress, one of the things that I recall as a very young boy, I was not even in school yet, uh, was the uh, person coming to pick my mother up to take her to the house for that particular day. And my mother not having the time to uh, properly see that I got to my aunt's, because I had an aunt that I would stay with during the day, and she told me to where I was to, to go. And look, I was old enough to, I was old enough to, to know how to go to the path, through the pathway and go to my aunt's house. But on this particular day, I took it upon myself that I was gonna follow the, the car that had come to pick up my mother. And uh, I did a pretty good tracking job all the way to the highway, which is Florida Boulevard. We call it Highway 190. I was about four years old. Uh, because remember, I started school probably when I was five and a half, but, but certainly I wasn't in school. And my uncle was, there was a store across that highway. Uh, and then when I got to the highway, of course, I couldn't track any further. I, that's the furthest I saw. So, and I was squatted there by the highway, and my uncle came and was coming from the store and saw me by the highway. He whipped me all the way. <laughs> he whipped me all the way back over to where I was, he knew where I was supposed to be. Uh, he whipped me all the way over to my, my every time I slow up, he stinged my legs a little bit more. And uh, I never forgot that. And uh, so after that, when my mother heard about it and found out about it, it distressed her. So she told persons uh, that she worked with that if they wanted her, I came along as a package. <laughs> <laughs> she, she wasn't taking a chance. Uh, and the odd part about that is, that uh, about a year and a half later I was struck by a car on that same highway because uh, that was a different different venue and almost killed. Uh, but I was with uh, one of my siblings and, and a cousin. Uh, but, uh, it, you know, I didn't, didn't learn my lessons. <laughs> when you were five? Is that how old you yeah, were? Yeah, you? I was five when I was hit by the car. Yeah. So your family? all kind of lived around the same area yeah when yeah up. did mm -hmm. you have any kind of special family traditions yeah we Christmas was always special we got one item one one kind of toy uh, uh, I can Thanksgiving uh, maybe a few firecrackers to pop it Fourth of July and stuff like that yeah uh, the, uh, most of our family history uh, surrounds being around the, the church and things like that. So we spent quite a bit of time because my parents were avid churchgoers. So we spent a lot of my time uh, in, in, in churches. Where yeah. did you go to church? Same church that I still attend, Church of God in Christ, Pentecostal Church. It's there on uh, 515 Rodeo Drive. Uh, it was, but 515 Martin Luther King to get used to saying it, uh, since I advocated for the part of the name change. Yeah. Um, was the church in the same place the whole time, or has yeah. it moved? Yeah, no. No, the church has it's been uh, some modest improvements made to it, but it's in the same place. Do you know what time, what year it was founded? Uh, no, I don't, uh, but it was founded uh, uh, 
some years I married before I was born. Uh, yeah, I think the church is probably that church is probably about 80, 80 years old. I would say. And you said you advocated for the road to be called MLK. Was that through your work with NAACP or just personal or both? No, no, I. I, I It was not just myself, but there were other persons who, who also uh, made advocates, uh, hoping that uh, bring a, a, a new breadth of, uh, of uh, enthusiasm and commitment to the area. Yeah. So when I say I was one of the persons that advocated, just one of the persons, uh, uh, and uh, Mr. Arthur Perkins and the mayor and some other persons. When did they change the name? Uh, this is the second year, I believe. Okay. Uh, two years. And then I did want to talk a little bit about your you are with your work with the NAACP. Can you talk about that? Well, I've always, like I said, uh, I, I, my my history sort of goes back to those early stages of being an advocate, a community activist, a community advocate. Uh, or whatever I uh, not only have I uh, did I advocate on that particular instance that I've run for office on several uh, instances uh, uh, most recently I was uh, elected to be a uh, Paris Democratic Paris executive committee uh, I work with uh, uh, practically every mayor uh, since I since I was in my teens, 18 or thereabout. I knew uh, Mayor, uh, uh, Matt Adams of Vic was a mayor when I was just a young man. He stayed, he was mayor for probably some 12 or 16 years until I was about 18 or thereabout. And Jail Burnett, my mother was one, that was one of those families that uh, my parents, uh, my mother worked for. And, uh, then after Mayor Burnett, Mayor Hoover, who I worked for, I told you, is, he became the mayor, and he was mayor for some 16 years. Um, and following uh, uh, him as the uh, uh, mayor, uh, let's see, as the mayor Jim uh, uh, DeLong was became the mayor, of course. He was the, had been the principal of my children's school at the elementary school. So we knew him and worked with him uh, right away. And then following him, uh, uh, James Durbin, Jimmy Durbin. Uh, and we had always had good relationship with, uh, with Jimmy Durbin. So I understand he's not going to run for mayor in the next term. So uh, I've had uh, some, some for well over over 50 years, 40, 50 years, some connection with and working with Mayor. So, uh, but then uh, I've just always felt that uh, it's right to do right by a person and that no person should ever have to suffer through the humiliation of some of the times that we went through, uh, that is of having signs put up over fountains. I, I go back to that particular time, segregated the Carroll Theater, which is now a antique place downtown, was segregated. Uh, blacks were relegated to seating at one position and whites in another, uh, which, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, doctors had to go through the back uh, to enter into the doctor's offices and wait in a little area, dentist's offices. Uh, so uh, the uh, concession stands, uh, tasted freeze and frosty in with two places. Uh, so uh, I've just always believed that uh, persons ought to have, uh, try to be on the right side of right and the right side of history. Uh, the NAACP was one of those organizations that was early in my memory stood out as standing for uh, the right of rights of person that everybody be treated equally. 
and one of the creeds of the NAACP uh, because even though there are some persons who have negative uh, imagery of the NAACP is, I mean, in the white communities in some cases because they don't have a true knowledge of the white, the NAACP wasn't an organization that was predominantly, uh, that were both whites and blacks that helped to establish the NAACP. Uh, and uh, so I still hold it as one of the uh, bright shining stars toward what we ought to be and the people we ought to be. So that's why I'm a part of, of the NAACP. Uh, I, I don't know of anything that the NAACP has stood for uh, that fostered uh, hatred or uh, where it, uh, and I wouldn't be a part of any organization uh, that was built uh, solely on hate for individuals or individual rights. I wouldn't be a part of it. Uh, and, and likewise, uh, I saw voting rights as being an important, so I'm president of the uh, People's Voters League, which is one of the oldest, uh, probably the oldest civil rights group here in Liberty Parish. Uh, uh, it was founded in 1963. Uh, and it, it, it was, 63 was about the time that I was coming into fruition and my knowledge as a, a young African, though I was too young to actually be a part of it, uh, I was old enough to, to know that there were persons who were advocating for the rights, equal rights of persons to vote, which I th we all know now is, is an absolute must uh, in any, any uh, uh, democratic society uh, uh, and uh, so as a result of that when I was old enough because when I began voting age was it was uh, 21 mm -hmm. and since that time it has been reduced to 18 but it wasn't 18 at the time but I could be on the fringes and I could uh, sit outside the meetings on the windows and, and hear what was going on and things of that sort and uh, Probably my earliest uh, inroad into uh, civil rights or anything of that sort was an incident that occurred when I was probably about 17. I, I don't have to go back and do a review of the history of it. A young man uh, was uh, uh, killed here in the. It was, it was an unfortunate accident. I was a young boy. Uh, two parents left the children out in the, in the car, a black parent and white parent. Uh, and unfortunately in the car of the white parent there was a gun that was in the glove compartment. And the child, uh, young boy got the gun. And I don't think that he meant it out of malice as we go ahead and look at it, but it was an unfortunate. And he went to the car where the other boy was and, uh, and pointed the gun and I guess in, in that situation, that was a perfect storm of bad things that was happening. Gun left in the car, parents, both with children, and he shot the other kid and killed him. Uh, and uh, I don't even know the name of the of the child. I know the name of the black child, and it created quite a furor in the community. What was the name of the child that was killed? Uh, he was a uh, uh, Mitchell was the last name. I, I have to remember what go back and remember what the uh, what the first name of the of the child was. Do you remember what year that happened? No, I don't, but I, I, I think I must have been about 17, so if you had Sometime 17, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know that uh, uh, it created quite a uh, fear uh, in the community, and there were persons who were angry by the fact that we had done, maybe thinking that it was done more out of malice and, and uh, I think, it, like I said again, it was just a situation that that uh, left itself open for something bad to happen. Uh, and uh, I can remember uh, as a young person speaking to the issue, and I wasn't even, a, I don't, no, I certainly wasn't, uh, so probably at my oldest I would have been 17. And I think that that was one of the reasons that persons thought I might 
be able to to speak because they know I normally wouldn't call an 18 year old to go in. But beside, I had the college experience and I had the reputation of not being shy to speak on what it was that uh, if something uh, bothered me or if I thought it was not right, uh, and I still haven't lost that. Uh, so uh, that, those are some of my early uh, ex experiences at, uh, at doing it. And uh, in speaking, uh, I was appointed at that young age as part of a delegation that went to talk with the mayor at that at that time and to sort of bring some quiet to to a situation and uh, that sort of launched me into where I am uh, at 66 still speaking out and still uh, being involved in uh, NAACP and uh, in uh, Voters League. What's your position within the NAACP? I'm the parish president for that branch here, Livingston branch, NAACP. Okay. Um, I think we need to wrap up, but uh -huh. this is, um, you know, we're gonna, we want this to be, the interview to be saved for Denver Springs residents or you know, anyone who's interested, is there anything particular you'd like to pass along as part of oral history about Denham Springs? I, yes, uh, the thing that I'd like to pass along is that, and I had, I had this saying is I'm a teacher of history, and so I'm one who, who primarily believes deeply that uh, history uh, is very important in being a uh, pointed to where we're headed. The fact is I used to tell my children, uh, my students uh, in class, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And uh, I meant that both literally and figuratively. I meant, <laughs> I meant that, <laughs> you know. And so I, the, the, the one lesson that I can say to, to a person, for more than 35 years, uh, uh, Dem Springs has had a, a a, has had a history that's been moving in in the right direction, moving in the direction. Arthur Perkins, I don't know if you know this, has served, I think this is his ninth term, serving as a, as a council member. Uh, and I think he serves all terms except one since probably about 1968 or, or seven. So the uh, one four year term span, I think is the only time that uh, Dennis Springs has been without uh, representation from all of his, his major components of his community. I would hope that Dennis Springs will continue in that particular vein and that it will continue to look for paths to making sure that all of his citizens are felt uh, well. There are persons who still say to me, uh, uh, have you always lived in Dennis Springs? And, and some of the impressions that persons have had and I can always point with pride to, yes, I've lived in Denham Springs all 66 years of my life. Have they all been perfect years? No, they have not. But I can also point to wherever anybody else is coming from and ask them, is the place where you are coming from any more perfect than, than the place where Denham Springs is? Uh, and I think that at, at its very least, we've had uh, families, and uh, mayors and persons who work for the good of all the community. And my advice to, to them would be to continue to do that. Finally, I, I would say blacks in this community have made quite a bit of uh, uh, inroads too, and they have done quite a bit. I have grandchildren now who are highly hailed as, for their athletic prowess uh, a grandson now who, even now they're licking their their chops, waiting for him to to, to reach the the high school. He's just in 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 middle school. A granddaughter who is uh, on the Denham Spring basketball team and is probably listed as uh, most likely to be a player of the year. She's already been sort of predicted. A uh, person like Tasman Mitchell who. Uh, provided sports and athletics, uh, and uh, 
we've got quite a number of persons who have made contributions. So Denham Springs is a place that is ripe for, for improvement and for growth. And my, my uh, desire is that in my lifetime that I've made some contribution to that. hope that I've always uh, tried to be on, as I say, the right side of right and uh, that uh, that'll continue even as uh, we go forward uh, for my uh, grands, my children, and grands, and, and persons who, uh, who look at this through a hysterical, uh, historical perspective. Uh, I guess that's as much as I can say. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, this is the end of the interview on Tuesday, December 10th, 2013, with Daniel Landry and I'm Sarah Colombo.